we just naturally assume that because we are now in the present, we have technologically advanced such that our clothes are better, our technology is better, our methods are better and more superior, and our clothing is more comfortable and more practical. That is not necessarily true. Hello, I am presently in Boston today. We have actually been sent here by today's sponsor, who you shall hear more about anon. We being myself, Morgan Donner, and Rachel Maxey. I thought we would take this marvelous opportunity, whilst we have three very eccentrically dressed humans in our midst, to go ahead and explore the topic of dress. I think people often think that they have to categorize themselves within one very specific preset style, be it goth, e-girl, lolita, uh, athleisure, whereas I don't think it has to be quite that specifically defined. Everyone's style is individual and it can be defined in whatever terms you like. I think my personal style in particular would be described as academic Victorian witch. Were you to have asked me five, seven, ten years ago what my ideal style were to be, I probably would not have been able to give you those terms because I don't think often one's particular personal style is quite so definable until one endeavors to explore style and experiment with different silhouettes and different fabrics and different garments. This has been said time and again. A personal style does not develop overnight. It does not develop over the course of one year, unless, of course, you have a very defined objective with it and a lot of money. In the beginning, I did not obviously start out dressing like an Edwardian. I still don't really completely dress like an Edwardian. And whereas my style has specifically gravitated more and more and more towards the end of the specifically historical spectrum, not everyone aspires to get there. There is a sort of degree on the scale of eccentricity that one can land. It's more of a percentage. Like, if I am going to work, then I would say it's more like 50%. I incorporate lots of elements that I enjoy in a sort of history-bounding kind of context or way. I will wear jewelry that is either historical or uh, historically inspired. I'll wear, again, the layering that I like. I will often do my hair up, but I won't as much as I might if I were purely gonna go out to hang out with friends. My style's often been described as like a 16th century pinup-esque thing. I love Italian 16th century clothing, especially of the lower like working classes. It's such a beautiful level of decoration, but also simplicity for the sake of practicality. And uh, so obviously I'm not wandering about in 16th century dresses per se, but I do love the layering aesthetic that they go for. I love the bright blues and reds and whites, so I incorporate that a lot into my dress. My amount of history integration varies from, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80% as the day requires. So for my personal style, I usually take inspiration from pretty much anything that I see. So it could be old photographs, it could be a movie like Lord of the Rings and Hobbits. Pretty much anything I watch and then instantly I want to recreate outfits. Um, I pretty much like to make outfits that tell a different story. This one's kind of like a, uh, a jock. So, you know, I just have always been fascinated with how style can kind of tell your own narrative and express yourself. When you find your true style, when you find the style that you really feel good in and you feel that expresses yourself really accurately, you have a different sort of confidence about you. You exude this sort of power and so I think that people are not quick to mess with you when you sort of walk down the street like you are a Victorian on a mission or whatever it is that your style is. There's definitely a different feel when you go out dressed vintage than when you kind of blend in with the crowd because that's exactly what it is. Mostly when you dress modern, people don't bat an eye and you just kind of can blend in and sometimes you want that. You also learn to just kind of not care what anyone thinks and just do it for yourself and the enjoyment of it for yourself. Uh, but you definitely have to get used to people staring 
and wondering what's going on and why you're dressed that way. Uh, whereas when you're wearing modern, people just kind of are just like, but I have gotten into some good conversations because you're dressed the way that you are, whether it's just from a passerby in the store or uh, some of my favorite conversations are with older people who can relate to the style a little bit more. Teenage girls seem to like it for some reason, which is very surprising because they are scary. <laughs> and so when they're the ones that are like, oh my God, I love your outfit. I'm like, oh. I feel like I've been like, and, 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 thank you, please don't, please don't make fun of me. You're part of their clan. When they accept you, you're like, oh. it's a good conversation starter. Uh, and I guess that's another reason why sometimes I don't dress vintage when I just, I guess, purely don't feel like talking to anyone or getting looks. It does boost your confidence too, especially when you love the outfit that you're wearing. You want other people to love the outfit that you're wearing. There's a lot of fear and lack of confidence in people who are just starting to get into historical dress because of the uncertainty of how the public are going to react. I mean, you just sort of get used to it. I don't even hear people on the street anymore. People perceive, I mean, honestly, quite wrongly, people perceive the past, the Victorian period, with a sort of elegance, a bygone elegance and propriety and status. When, I mean, obviously we know as historians in reality that is not true, but nevertheless that kind of does work to your advantage nowadays because people do treat you with a likewise sort of reflected sense of propriety and elegance. Which I think is a sort of interesting commentary on the weight that we put on visual judgment on people within society. It's kind of interesting because we do equate certain appearances with wealth and therefore with higher status. And in a weird way, it's almost as if you can sort of cheat that system by taking on a style of dress that people associate with respected positions in society. And especially if you know how to sew, you can make these silhouettes and you can make these appearances yourself. You don't necessarily have to be that sort of class status in order to achieve that, that level of respect. One of the things that I really love about historical dress, both for full-on events where you're literally like copying a painting and going 100%, it's so lovely to have that stepped out of a painting feel. I love that with history bounding, you get like a little, a little piece of that for your everyday, which is fantastic. There are, I'm sure, lots of reasons why you might feel like you could or couldn't do it. Just take the elements that work well with your own wardrobe when it comes to incorporating historical elements. I'm a big fan of the jewelry, <laughs> so I have tons of reproduction jewelry pieces because they make me happy. And even if nobody else recognizes what they're from, I know exactly like what dig uh, that reproduction was based off of. Another one of my favorite things to incorporate is the hairstyles because that is something that you could wear like jeans and a t-shirt with if you really wanted to. You're not gonna get as much of a I feel weird or I feel like I look weird. That could be a really nice way to enjoy, you know, trying out that hair technique that you read in a manuscript and like in pieces and then like modifying it to work well with a style that you feel comfortable going to the grocery store into, right? I dress up vintage, I guess would be the term, probably 80% of the time. There is a lot of times where I will just throw on a sweatshirt and whatever skirt I have lying around just to run to the store or something. I think sometimes it's nice to sit down and actually get dressed and put on the full makeup and plan out your outfit. But yeah, I would say probably 80, 85% of the time I like to kind of craft my outfit rather than just throw on whatever is lying on my bedroom floor. Having a made historical dress, having owned historical dress, having worn historical dress, I found that there are actually a number of practicalities that you just cannot get from modern clothing nowadays. Long skirts, you would think, are highly impractical. Yes, it does make going upstairs a little bit more challenging. You do learn to walk a little bit differently. However, I have found that lining your skirts in stiff material, in tarlatan, for example, hold your skirt out and sort of stiffen it in a way that it sort of stays out of your way and you don't step on it necessarily so much when you go upstairs. There are perceived impracticalities of historical dress 
and these perceived impracticalities were actually often solved by people in the period who had to do similar activities to the activities that we have to do today. The benefit of long skirts is that you can wear nine petticoats underneath and you are the warmest person walking down that blustery, wintry, snowy, windy New York City wind tunnel of a street. The layering is practical for colder weather and the natural fibers used in historical dress were extremely practical and still are extremely practical for these summer months. We don't realize often nowadays that polyester synthetic fibers are plastic and plastic doesn't breathe. When you put on a polyester shirt in the summer, you are going to sweat to death. If you put on a cotton or a linen shirt, these are natural fibers, they're plant materials whose natural engineering it is to absorb moisture. They absorb moisture in their plant form and they absorb moisture from the skin when you are wearing them. So they keep you nice and cool, they're light, they're washable, highly practical. And this is something that we've just forgotten today because synthetic fibers are cheap and they are accessible and they are easily mass producible. And that's what we care about. We often forget nowadays that modern society runs on profit, it runs on capitalism, it runs on efficiency. It doesn't necessarily run on practicality. I don't walk into a high street shop and think, I want that, I need that, I don't know. I think when you have devoted your life to studying or exploring or having an interest in historical dress and looking into how these clothes were produced and the methods that they were produced with and how they were worn, how they were loved and treated and cared for, you sort of have no desire to go into a high street shop. You sort of look at these clothes and you're like, eh, could do better and especially when you learn how to sew or when you learn how to alter or mend, you think, oh, but I could do this with it. I could alter it like this and make it like this. And it gets to the point where you're like, I could just make it myself. I could make it to fit me. I could make it out of a lot more comfortable materials. I can actually cut the arm size correctly because modern high street shops never cut the arm size correctly. And of course, I never opt to wear modern clothes over historical clothing because I just, don't have it in my wardrobe. I stopped buying it many, many years ago, and all I've really been doing nowadays is making new clothing in the historical way that I want it to be. So I've just sort of, over the years again, accumulated a wardrobe of historical and historically inspired articles of clothing. I have had a few weird encounters. A lot of it is very similar. A lot of it is people asking, specific questions like if you're in costume. I was in college one time in our cafeteria, just walking by one of the tables, someone seriously and not even trying to be mean or anything, they were like, are you, are you in a play? You get that a lot, just because I think people don't process the fact that some people want to dress different time periods or different eras of style, so I think the way that they process it is, oh, they must be dressing up for a reason. There must be a production of some sort going on. <laughs> I also have gotten some drunk guy <laughs> was like, it's too early for Halloween. You get a lot of that. You get a lot of people who don't understand what you're going for. So yeah, you definitely, you get your fair share of meaningful conversations that come out of how you dress and also real weird conversations too. I feel like I've been very fortunate, and maybe it's because of how I integrate historical fashion. I've had very, very little in the way of like coworkers, you know, giving me side eye because I'm dressed funny. Like I, I literally go to work five days a week, so it's not like I'm only doing this, you know, when I like jump down to the library, and therefore I don't have to care what people think. Like I work with people every day, and I do my like. 50% history founding pretty much all the time. Uh, but I recognize that perhaps I am consciously or subconsciously choosing a level of, of integration that makes me comfortable, that I feel like I can get away with. Um, I'm sure that if you asked people in my office what I'm up to, they'd be like, oh yeah, she's the girl who wears dresses all the time. But that's about as much <laughs> reaction, I think, that you would get out of them. So I definitely think it's possible to mix in what makes you happy while still keeping that comfortable balance. I definitely feel very comfortable in my, my level of boundiness. I very rarely will wear something out that makes me go, this is too much. Like I have either decided that I'm comfortable with it or I go, 
no, I would rather not wear that to the office. Especially if you struggle with anxiety, with social anxiety, if you are a very heavy introvert, I find that having a set of well-known and familiar and comfortable clothes really, really, really helps. I find that when I have a new article of clothing, it does take me a couple of wears of feeling very self-conscious in I'm wearing this new article of clothing, this feels very strange, before I start to, before it sort of becomes part of me and it becomes sort of like a second skin. And I think that is part of the process of acclimatizing yourself to the notion of wearing eccentric or unusual or historical clothing is just wearing them often enough that they become part of you. You know how they move, you know your body language, how you have to behave in an article of clothing like that, for example, long skirts, you know how much floor circumference you take up so that you can go about your day in a perfectly practical and functional capacity. I do think it's definitely worth it because I just feel like life is short and we are put here to express ourselves and if that is how you want to dress yourself then that's just another way to do it and I think yeah it brings me a lot of joy and I think people who have unique styles or just styles that make them happy it is something to look forward to if it makes you happy then it makes you happy <laughs> It is completely worth the effort in sourcing clothing, in making clothing, in doing the research to explore what your style would be. Whether it is historical or whether it's something more fantastical, I think it is completely worth it. You brighten people's days, you sort of enlighten them to the fact that things are possible. You don't necessarily have to conform to very rigid, specific set beliefs and rules of society. You can express yourself. You are allowed this freedom in your life. Occasionally you will get a strange or perhaps disapproving look in regards to your style and you just kind of feel bad for them honestly because this is a person who has been so beaten down by society and so forced to conform to a very specific preset system of beliefs and system of rules that they just have no creative freedom, no personal expression. And it's kind of sad and it really does remind me why this is important in dress as well as in any other area of existence, to be quite honest. Learning how to think differently, learning how to think for yourself, learning how to look at things in a different way. I mean, this is how humanity grows. This is how society benefits from new ideas, from new innovations. I mean, I know I'm taking this in a completely sort of lofty, philosophical, overall general view of the world, but I think as a concept, it is important. It is important that we learn to think for ourselves and not to sort of conform for the sake of conforming and to express ourselves in ways that make us feel happy and make us feel like our best, most complete, most fulfilled selves, because that's ultimately how we can better help others and how we can better serve society. So the reason why the three of us have ended up here in Ye Old Mary Boston is because this video is actually sponsored by June's Journey. June's Journey have just released a brand new, big, shiny new update which involves collaboration and people playing together. First of all, they have introduced two new games. So in order to play these new games, you have to first form a club of some friends. These can be online fellow June's Journey member friends or IRL friends. So we all have phones because this is the 21st century sort of. So we have been granted a new icon with this update, and that is this detective lounge. Okay, what do we want our club name to be? Hmm. Historically <laughs> adequate. Well, yeah, because it can't be historically accurate because there's no such thing. Can you spell adequate? I shall Google this thing. <laughs> After some minor technical difficulties. Uh, so now we have a club, and you all folks can join. Oh, I have to apply. Approve. Oh, thanks. Much celebration. So now, in theory, we can start competing against other clubs. In order to play these games, we need a lot of energy points. And in order to get more energy points, they have set up this game so that you can buy each other coffees and basically gift each other energy. So in theory, we are now ready to play. If you would like to see little sneak previews of how the games work and see if and when we do crush the June's Journey development team, that shall be on both of their channels, regardless of whether you want to see the games, but these two are very <laughs> awesome fellow adventurers. And of course, thank you to June's Journey for sending us on this wonderful adventure to begin with. Let's get back to some adventures. All right. Shenanigans, Miss Bernadette. Definitely. <laughs> I don't know if that's a 
Oh, this is why I don't do interviews. No, I think this is a rugby ball. <laughs> yeah, is it? I don't know. Is it a basketball? I don't know, but it looks like I play sports. Oh, oh it's hot in here. This is very hot. I'm trying to think of how to end that thought. What was the question? <laughs> I don't remember. It'll all be fine. <laughs>